All right, Romans chapter 8. Uh, we were here last week, and, and again, I'll read verse 1. It says, There is uh, therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So the, the condemnation here has nothing to do with salvation. It has to do with your walk with Jesus Christ. Uh, it has to do with your walk after you get saved. So the whole context of this chapter is a new man, old man, and the, the problems that you're going to have to deal with in this life. And there is all kinds of problems. Uh, so we we're down in verse, uh, verse 18. We get down to that. Uh, verse 17 says, If the children then be heirs, heirs of God, and I looked at that long, last time, uh, you got saved uh, whenever you, I got saved in 1980. I became an heir of God right then and there. There's, there's no more question of that. There's no more me having to worry about my salvation. I'm an heir of God. Uh, but that next question right there, that next statement says, and joint heirs with Christ, that's something you earn. Uh, that's, that's the judgment seat of Christ stuff. That's your, the things you do uh, that gets through the fire, the wood, hay, and stubble burns up, the gold, silver, precious stones. Uh, if you just want to get saved and just be saved and, and get into heaven, there's, there's, there's a lot of room for that. That's what my dad, uh, 30 years, wasted his life. 30 years he wasted uh, and he spent the last uh, 10, 12 years of his life trying to correct some things. Didn't get a lot of it corrected, but I'm sure he got something in heaven uh, for the last 12, 13 years. But there is two. You, you can be heir of God. That's salvation. But the heir, joint heir with Christ. Uh, if so be that we suffer. Now, there, here's this phrase right here. If so be that we suffer with him. Uh, there, and we went through some suffering things. And I, I started talking about some suffering things. And it's just, I did that on... on uh, it's amazing. I'm doing that thing on Thessalonians on Wednesday nights, and I went through suffering for a while, and everybody kept saying, why are you sticking on sufferings for so long? Well, you're right here again. If we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So now we're in verse 18. For I reckon, uh, that's Paul, that's, uh, he's a southern guy. He says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, uh, what Paul is talking about here in context of, of Romans chapter 8, the sufferings of, go back to 17. Uh, and if the children then heirs with God, join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him. So he's talking about that we may be also, that we may all be also glorified together. So the suffering there is, is what Paul's talking about in 18, but it goes on, take your Bibles, go over to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 4, 17. It goes a little bit further than that. But this, this world is a veil of tears. And uh, there's just no way out of it. Watch this, uh, 16. F uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 16. For which cause we faint not. And brethren, you don't want to faint. I mean, I like it. There's a proverb back here that says, that if we faint in the... T uh, in the day of battle, uh, we're a little, I'm paraphrasing, but you're, you're a little strength. So you can't faint. You've got to figure out how not to faint. I've seen people where they uh, see somebody bleed and they faint. Uh, I mean, sorry, man. It's just life is life. You've got to get used to stuff. You can't faint. You've got to go on. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Old man, new man. You're not going to get away from this. Everything you look in the Bible, that's exactly what this is. For our light affliction. So anything you're going through is a light affliction. It's not hard at all. It's very easy. Uh, I had an old lady one time, which I don't really care too much for. Uh, she always used to tell me, suck it up, buttercup. Uh, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh uh, for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal but the things which are not seen are eternal. So what you're getting here is a, a uh, uh, looking at verse 17, back in Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 18, uh, back to 17. He's, he's sitting there telling you in Romans, he says, uh, if you're going to be an heir of Jesus Christ, if you want to rule and reign with him, uh, and Dr. Roman's going to, I'm telling you what, I'm not plagiarizing any of Doc's stuff. I'm just using everything he has. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest right up front. Uh, I am a moron and... And the more I read what Dr. Roman wrote uh, and just his, his way he looks at stuff, uh, the more I realize how uh, ignorant most Christians are today because we don't look at this thing like it should be looked at. Uh, we, we look at the world like it is something, and this is a, 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 this is a very temporal thing. Uh, Donald Trump, President Donald Trump, President-elect Donald Trump, 
Uh, I'll be honest, I am glad President-elect Donald Trump got elected. I am glad he's putting everybody in, in uh, office that he's putting in and he's trying to get them through. I am glad that he's going to go at them with uh, vehement anger. I am glad that I hope he does to them what they did to him a sevenfold. Uh, and I mean, really, for he's a perfect example of what a Christian ought to be. I'm not saying he's a Christian. I said he's a perfect example of what a Christian ought to be. Uh, they tried for 10, 12 years to kill him. They tried to, I mean, thank God he was a billionaire. Uh, and he had a couple bucks that he could fight that thing back because we couldn't. Uh, but he hung in there and, and even to the, uh, the getting shot at. I mean, if, if, I don't know how much you know about that thing, but I think it's the, the, the blessings of God. Because he was sitting here and the guy was over here and he was going to shoot him right in the side of the head with a bullet. And something got his attention and he turned his head just like this and the bullet went right by and got his ear. If that thing had not got, if he'd have stayed in the position looking at the crowd like he was looking at, he'd be a dead man right now. I mean, and you're talking about a bullet. How fast is the bullet? It moves pretty quick. So whatever it was, is right at that nanosecond, he turned his head, pew, there it was. And uh, you sit there and look at all that stuff, but as a, he never quit. He just never, ever, ever quit. He kept going. And Christians, we just quit. When it gets hard, when the going gets rough, the rough gets going. Or when the going gets rough, the tough get going or something like that. Uh, but we're just the other way around. We don't do that. We don't continue on. And, and life is, is a terrible thing. The sufferings are temporal. You've got to remember that everything that we're going through is a temporal thing. Uh, I'm 67 years old, and if the Lord came back tomorrow, uh, you, may, you may be 20, 25, 30, whatever. Uh, your, your problems is definitely over. But, but he sits there and says, for I reckon the sufferings, and Paul's talking, he says the present time, he's looked at, at uh, some things that he's going out into an eternal realm, and that's where you got to get. That's why I always talk about the book Pilgrim's Progress. The one thing I got is here's a, here's a man, he comes from the city of destruction. City of destruction is a place in your Bible. It's called city of destruction, actually, in your Bible. Uh, Bunyan gets a hold of that thing and writes a book. Everybody, I've had people say, well, he's doctrinally incorrect. Yeah, yeah, but they're morons. You're just a moron. Not you guys, but they are. Uh, what they're trying to do is they're trying to, they're trying to strain in a gnat and swallow a camel. His, his thing is, you got, you're, you're coming out of this world, and the world is going to be destroyed, and you're headed to the celestial city, and that you can't forget. Everything you have is there. It's not here. Everything we have is there. And you won't know that. I mean, if we could be like Paul, what would have been so great? Like uh, 2 Corinthians 12. You ought to go read 2 Corinthians 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, Paul was caught up to the third heaven, and what he's seen there, he could not utter. I mean, and John got to go see that thing, and, and Elijah and Moses got to go see that thing, and, and they got to come back in, in uh, actually, they probably came up from Abraham's bosom, so they, they may or may not have got to see heaven at the point where they were transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration, because both of those guys was going to be down in, in Abraham's bosom at that time. Uh, Christ hadn't died on the cross, he hadn't went to paradise, he hadn't taken them up. Uh, so they, they were probably down there. I, I don't know how, I mean, unless the Lord called them up and let them see the thing. But brethren, uh, our sufferings, our sufferings are temporal. Although they don't feel temporal sometimes. I mean, I don't know if you went through some things. Uh, young people go through certain things. Uh, as you get older, older people look at you and think that you're crazy for going through what you're going through. Like you're, you're moaning and whining and complaining about all the stuff you're going through. Because we've done, been there, done that. But in our day, when we were your age, it hurt too. <laughs> The same things you, you have going on in your life, I had going on in my life when I was 12, 13, 14, 15, 20. Uh, and it hurt just as bad then as it does now. I look back on it now, I'm like, what an idiot was I. Uh, but, but in the day, uh, but I got other things. I got something going on right now in our family that there's nothing you can do about it. It's just, it's a uh, problem. Uh, and it, 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 it's there, and it's the flesh, and the flesh gets involved, and there's just nothing you can do. So it's temporal. But the glory is eternal. The afflictions are light. Man, can you buy over in, in uh, 2 Thessalonians? For our light afflictions. Paul is saying anything that happens to you is light. You get thrown in prison, get your teeth pulled out, your toenails yanked off, your fingernails yanked off, your skin flayed off. Those are light afflictions, just light. Uh, they're temporal. They're, it's going to quit. You're going to die and you're going to go to heaven. So uh, he, he says, and you look at Paul. Paul was beat, whipped. Uh, I mean, he, they just tried everything in the world to shut him up and they just couldn't. He's like the Donald Trump 2,000 years ago. They, they couldn't make him shut up, no matter what they did. He got a hold of something. He's like Elon Musk. I, I mean, I, wish, I hope Musk gets saved, because he's going to be up here now with Franklin Graham, and I think Franklin Graham uh, might have an influence on Elon Musk. 
but anybody who changed sides like he changed sides, here's a guy on your side, uh, the richest man on the face of the planet, and they treated him like garbage on that side. That's, that's just like Jesus Christ. He was on the right side, and they, they treated him like garbage. Then he moves to the other side, and then they still treat him like garbage. But their sufferings are temporal. The afflictions are light. But the glory is exceeding. Now, he's talking here in verse 18. He says, For I reckon that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. There is going to be some things revealed in you that when you see those things, you're going to really wish you'd have done more here than there. Uh, that you won't have an opportunity at that point to ever increase that anymore. Uh, faithful, that, how about, I like this song. Faithful to death, faithful to death, said our loving master. A few more days to labor and wait. Toils of the road will then seem as nothing. As we sweep through that beautiful gate. Man, you're going to go right through that gate one of these days. You're going to see, Peter, there ain't nobody's going to stop you. I mean, they're going to hold you up. You're going to go right in that thing, and you're going to see the glory that God has for all eternity hanging out there, and that is yours. And then you're going to say, wait a second, I could have had, he goes, yep. He said, there's a lot more you could have been involved with, but you didn't. And he goes, and then you're going to look at somebody over here that you think was, is, and brother, I'm not telling you you have to go out and kill yourself. It's all a heart thing. He said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You know, the hardest thing you'll ever do is find a way to love somebody that is just all messed up. Uh, you, ought to, you ought to choose somebody who's all messed up that you know and just start praying for him. I thank God for my dad. I mean, he, uh, my dad was a wicked man. I mean, wicked wasn't even a word for it. He's a wicked, very wicked man, exceedingly wicked man. Uh, but the Lord used him in my life to show me that we're still all men. Like Brother Steve was talking about, the uh, old man, new man, standing in the state. Uh, that will get a hold of you, and, and you, you're not going to come out too good. I don't care who you are on this planet, you're not going to come out too good. Uh, you, the reason the devil hadn't got a hold of you yet is because the Lord's been holding back. But anyways, uh, how about the other song, It Will Be Worth It All, When We See Jesus. Uh, life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. Uh, you know, then all of a sudden you're going to get this, this epiphany, and you're going to, oh, everything I went through back there that I shunned and decided I wasn't going to, I didn't want to stand up for Jesus, uh, if I'd only known this. You know how you know that stuff? Well, we just went through five nights of this. Bible, 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 Bible. I had people come up to me and say, why do you read your Bible four times? They obviously watch our podcast. And they watch, they do. They, I had people come up and thank me for the podcast. Uh, this, I've had people th thank me for this. And this right here, five nights, th Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, five nights of this stuff, five days and nights of this, Bible, 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 Bible. You say, well, why do you read your Bible? Because the more, you got to do something. If you do this, guess what? You won't be doing something else. You may not be getting nothing out of it. It doesn't matter. You're not going to be doing something else. And it's just a choice you make. You know what the Lord does? He looks down there and he goes, look at that idiot. He's, I'm talking about me now. Look at that idiot. He's trying to read his Bible four times. He actually listens to Scorby every chance he gets driving down the road. He still don't get nothing. <laughs> he's an idiot. He's a moron. But he's trying. He goes, look, he's doing something. He's doing something. I read through uh, Isaiah just before I came here tonight. In Isaiah in 712 B.C., uh, said that Cyrus was going to let the Jews go back. Well, the Jews didn't even go into captivity in 606. So that's 100 years later. Cyrus isn't even born yet. And then uh, 70 years, Daniel, Daniel uh, is 606, goes into captivity. Nehemiah, Ezra doesn't go back to five something. So you now you're looking at 200 years later, and Nehemiah doesn't go back to 480 something BC. So you're 480, 580, 680, uh, 7, you're looking at 250 years later when Nehemiah goes back to build the walls. And here is, Nehemiah is sitting there, going, or, or Isaiah is saying, yeah, my, I said, I know the end from the beginning, man, you can trust me. I'm, trust me, guys, trust me. I know what you're going to go through and I know it's going to hurt. He goes, as a matter of fact, I know it's going to hurt you guys so much, I'm going to come down and I'm going to go through it with you that you'll see me go through it with you. I'm going to come down, and there's going to be a day a woman's going to have And he, he even says that over in Isaiah. A, a, a woman's going to have a child, and they're going to call his name Wonderful and, and Mighty Counselor and all that other stuff. 
And then Isaiah 53 says he's just going to get beaten, hung on a cross, and he's going to die and shed his blood of cow. He's going to go through the same things that we go through. He had the same hurts that you have, the same hurts I have. When he sits there and Paul is saying this, Paul knows exactly what the Lord is saying when he says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time. Paul's gone through a whole lot of stuff. He changed his whole lifestyle uh, on that road to Damascus when he got knocked down. He changed his thinking. His thinking changed. And, I mean, he chunked his entire career. The world went away. So, anyways, back to this. I better watch out. I will, I will digress. Uh, every Christian needs to develop, and Dr. Ruttman calls it the long look, and you always hear me, and I tell it's it's the pilgrim progress. It is, I, I know where I came from, and I know where I'm headed, and in this path, I know that I'm here, but I don't know how long this path is still going to be for me. But I, I can look back and see where I came from and how long I've been on this path and how I fell and all this other stuff back here. But I'm still on this path and I'm still heading for the celestial city. Not the clock on the wall, but the celestial city. I'm headed to heaven. Dr. Roman calls it the long look. And what he's telling you is you need a long look in life. If you're looking at temporal things and what is occurring today, and, and you're, then everything that occurs today will be what makes you happy or makes you sad. Uh, I'm not happy or I'm not sad about anything. Uh, the situation's going on in our family right now doesn't faze me one bit. You know why? Because it don't bother me. It's, it has nothing to do with me. Uh, I didn't do what it took to get in the mess that people get in. As a matter of fact, I warn people not to get in messes, but they don't listen. And I can't even get mad if somebody does something stupid. If they want to do something stupid, then go for it, man. I'm just not going to do something stupid with you. I've done, done enough stupid stuff in my life. I don't want to do no more stupid stuff. Every Christian needs to develop what we call the long look. And I am going to agree with him 100%. Christians become fix, fixated on the world here, right there now. I'm going to get this, I'm going to get this, I'm going to get this, I'm going to get this. And there's nothing wrong with getting stuff. There's nothing wrong with getting stuff. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say you can't have anything. I went down to Florida, and uh, uh, Yoakum asked me to come over to a barbecue and I went to the barbecue with him, and the guy had a 71 Dodge Duster, uh, the Twister? Yeah, a Twister. Do you know the car I'm talking about, Steve? Mm -hmm. It was, the paint job on this thing looked better than any factory paint job I've ever seen. I mean, it was a thick looking paint. Uh, it was lime green, uh, it, immaculate. He opened up the trunk, and he had his batteries in the back, and he had his fuel cell in the back, and, I think it had like a 440 or something in it, and, and he started going through the, the work that the engine had, and he had to send the heads off out in the California. That's probably a seventy six, seventy, eighty thousand dollar car. It was sitting on a piece of property that was probably a million and a half, two million dollars. Easy, easy. I mean, his house, his garage that sit probably 150 feet from his house looked as good as his house did. And he goes, Mike, this is what the guy told me. He goes, Mike. I'm sitting there looking at his car, and I tell him about my little 62 Chevy Turno with a 327 three-speed. It's got rusted out fender wells and everything else that I didn't. I said, this ain't, I said, this ain't even nowhere near this thing, man. This is, that's, this is, it was a good car for me. I liked it. I enjoyed it. He goes, Mike, this is a disease. I knew exactly what he was talking about. He says, he goes, you see that garage down there? I said, yeah. Because we were just sitting out on his back. I mean, fully manicured deck and everything out there. It wasn't even a deck. He had the, the, the pavers all over the place and his pool went down into there's uh, pavers all around the pool and had his little barbecue pit thing over here and, and had his shelter. Every, I mean, it's a million and a half, two million dollar home. They were in, I didn't even walk in his house, didn't have to. Uh, three car, four car garage on the house and then a big old garage. He said, the, that garage down there is full of these things. <laughs> so the guy's got some cash. And I went, he, but you know what? He just got, uh, he just graduated. Uh, Dr. Peacock's one year, he's never done that in his life. He just graduated that thing. And his, eye, his eyeballs went off. And he was out there at, at helping us when we was building that barn out on the Navajo Nation, that, that addition on the side of that house. He was right there with us building that thing. Uh, in the sun, in the hot, flipping wood and everything else, doing the whole thing. And he goes, Mike, this is a disease. I said, yeah, I know it is. I said, that's why I don't do it. He goes, once you get started, it's hard to let go of the thing. I said, yep, that's exactly why I don't do it. I said, I want, and I told him, and I, and I started going off on the same thing. He knew I knew exactly what I was talking about. I said, I could build these suckers, man. I could build exactly what you've got right here. Uh, and I said, but I am not going to put the money in this thing that it takes. To, because once I get started, I said, I already know my, it's like these apartments. I won't quit. 
I already know what's going to happen. I won't quit. It'll kill me. So every Christian needs to develop what we call the long look. Christians become fixated on this world here. The physical world has many beautiful, wonderful sights to enjoy. It does, man. I've been all over the planet. Uh, if you've been anywhere, just in the United States, there's all kinds of stuff. Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon, you'll hear everybody says, oh, the Grand Canyon's beautiful. And it's, you know that's a judgment, right? That's a judgment of God, right? You do know that, right? That's the runoff. If his judgment looks that good, can you imagine what his places where there is no judgment needed in heaven is going to look like? But the Grand Canyon is, is where all the water off of Noah's flood flooded down through there and wore out all that stuff almost instantaneously. That's God's judgment. Billions of people died, and that's what that is. But the physical world has many beautiful sights. Uh, but at the same time, it's a veil of tears. You've got to remember this place is a mess. You've got to have that long view. Keep your eye on the, on the Lord. It's sorrows, cares, and troubles can overwhelm you, and, uh, and it will. I've watched people. I've got something going on, like I said, in our family right now uh, where a young man is, is overwhelmed. He's just overwhelmed. And, and if you don't watch out, it'll take you to a place where there may not be a, a place to get back. Uh, so it, it'll overwhelm you. The Christian has the ability to enjoy the good things of God and, and that he's put on earth without becoming attached to them. There is where the problem lies. So when Paul is sitting there talking about verse 18, he says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present life, present time, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What we do is we try to get that glory here right now in the things we have. And brother, I'm telling you, there's nothing wrong with getting anything. You can get anything you want. Just don't get attached to it. Let that thing come in and out of your fingers. I like Dr. Ruttman. Dr. Ruttman let money come in and out of his fingers all the time. We were sitting in class one time, and he goes, somebody was trying to get him to go to India. He said, I'm not going to go to India. He said, I can't go to India. He said, those people over there are starving to death. He said, they worship cows and bees and, and, and frogs, and, and they won't eat nothing. And he goes, they're starving to death. He said, I'm not going to go over there and preach the gospel to them unless I had $40,000. I'm not going to go. I can't go and not be able to give them something to get them through some of the troubles they're in. That was on a Sunday night. Monday, somebody brought a paper bag into the bookstore with 40 grand in it and threw it in the bookstore. He said, give this to Dr. Ruttman. Now what's your excuse? <laughs> you wanted 40 grand to go, there's your 40 grand. He didn't ask for 40 grand. He just threw that number. He should. He's like a guy that hit the arrows on the ground three times. He messed up. He should have said, I won't, I won't go for 100 grand. I mean, you think 40 is, uh, our God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. What is 40,000 him anyways? See, we look at our little $2.50, or, or, and we think, you know, that's a lot of money. And to us, it may be. But, brethren, you've got to watch that thing. This thing will get you. The Christian, has, you can enjoy anything. If you want to go on, vac go, go on vacations. I haven't got time anymore. I told Peacock this, Dr. Peacock, I, I just don't have time. Uh, if I do what I'm supposed to do on a daily basis, uh, I mean, if I try to do what I think I need to do, I've got Beth and four other people come. Here comes Jesse the other day. Dad? Happy birthday. I'm like, okay. She goes, oh, by the way, have you got a projector that can project up on the wall with a computer that can do this and do this and do this? I'm like, why? She goes, oh, I want to paint up here on the wall in the, in the thing. And so it's a good cause. See that paper cutter right there? That was so that she could cut a book for Dr. Peacock. <laughs> and then we need it. We need it. I'm telling you, it's a better paper, cut, paper cutter than we had. I need to get the blade sharpened anyways. But it was like, then Beth comes up. My dishwasher's throwing ball bearings at me. Now, you might not think that's an issue, but, I mean, it still takes time to go find the right part and get the part on order. And then my little thing out there tells me the temperature outside the batteries are dead, and it's not telling me what the temperature is. And then another person will come up, and another person will come up, another person will come up, another person. You know what the Lord says? Don't faint. And then Beth will go, well, if you didn't have so much talent, you wouldn't be you so bad. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I just want to go have, get hit in the head somewhere and come into amnesia. Oh, uh, <laughs> Drool or something like that, so I don't have to drink my coffee. <laughs> but you can enjoy the world. There's nothing wrong with enjoying it. I don't have time. But if you can do that, if you can enjoy this world, that's fine. But don't let, the problem is that it'll get a hold of you and won't let go, and then you're going to miss what's on the other side. And that's what Paul is right here trying to, I'm going to get to that a second ago. There is nothing, uh, wait a minute, Christians are strangers and pilgrims. Do you really believe you're a stranger and a pilgrim on this planet? If you don't believe you're a stranger and a pilgrim, you got a problem because you are a stranger. Go out there and try to tell people about Jesus Christ and see what they do. They get really mad. Christians are strangers and pilgrims on the earth. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. That, and I'm telling you what, that you, 
Those songs that we read, we read uh, Great Hymns of the Faith, the reason I chose that songbook is that the songs that's in that book are amazing. Uh, it's these, like these people really know it, know it. So, beloved, there is nothing that death or the rapture won't solve your problems. If you've got problems, I don't care how bad they are. If the Lord came back today, your problems would be over. And, and you may see problems that you may think will last a thousand years. I'm going to tell you from 70, 67 years, I've watched it come and go. And I, had, I was working with a, a, a lost guy one time. And he said, Mike, and we were talking about work. And everything was changing. He goes, ah, stick around for three years. Everything changes back. He goes, he goes it always, and so if you're just a new person walking in and you see all the troubles and everything at work, you would freak out. This guy's been there long enough. He looked like Methuselah. And he said, ah, it changes back in three. Just, just deal with it and go on through it. Uh, so you gotta, you got to get to the place where the verse says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The glory, you got to, what's going to be revealed in you is something that you need to get a really good grasp of. This is what's going to happen. Uh, beloved, there is, there is nothing that the rapture of death won't solve for a Christian. I said that. Uh, the worst thing that can happen to a Christian is death, and that's not even bad. Uh, after that, it's glory for me, man. You're on your way to heaven. Uh, in light of that, Christians should live for the next life, not this one. What Paul is trying to say here is this present world is not worth living for. He goes, if you're living for this present world, you're going to miss up. Now you say, well, that's just one verse. Hey, man, I'm only going to get through like three or four verses, maybe. I might even get through this one. The long look is laying up treasures in heaven and not building a bank account down here. I'm going to tell you what the long look is. Dr. Rutman gives a really good long list of what the long look is. If your long look is right, uh, you're actively, if you've got a bank account, you know what it takes to put money in the bank. Uh, if you work, you know what it does. A long look is laying up treasures in heaven, not building a bank account down here. A long look is living with the judgment seat of Christ always in your mind. Uh, if, if I seem to do some, he said this, <laughs> And I'm, I can agree with him. Uh, if, if you look at me, people say, you're crazy. I, I've had people, I've had people, Christians, that are, are, they give the impression that they're serving God. They said, you're an anomaly, Elliot. I said, no, you've been talking to Dr. Peacock, because Dr. Peacock calls me an anomaly. He goes, all you did is you're repeating what he said. I'm repeating what Dr. Roman said, but you're just repeating what somebody else said. No, I'm not. I said, I said you are setting your sights down here, and I'm saying stuff that's irritating you, in your way you're setting your sights here. I said, set your sights here. I don't care. I said, I'm not going to set my sights here. I've, I've given that thing up a long time ago. I let go of some of that stuff. You should always look at that judgment seat. There's going to come a day where you're going to go to that judgment seat and you're going to stand before Jesus Christ. Forget everybody else. Uh, right now, he gives us the opportunity to get that thing down and, uh, it, and, and live a life that's pleasing to him because you want to be glorified with That's what the verse says which the glory which shall be revealed in us. You know how you get that glory? you that long look. You know how you get the long look? I'm going to tell you. Read your Bible. Uh, the long look is, is being soul conscious. The long look tries to prepare for the judgment. The long look is realizing that someday uh, everything you see around you is going to burn up. <laughs> well, that sounds crazy, but I mean, you go to Revelation 21 and it's just all, it's all toast. Uh, and it's, it, and you really, you look at World War II, World War I, and we're right in a place where a world, a world war could start. I mean, Trump could start a world war in about 15 seconds if he don't watch out what he does. But I don't really care because I got the Lord on my side. And, and as long as they, they said uh, uh, right, Air, right Pat Air Force Base is one of the very first places going to get hit anyway, so you won't have to worry about it. The long look is realizing that someday uh, everything you see around you is going to burn up. Uh, but it's nothing wrong with having stuff around you. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't get your finger. Let it slip through your fingers, like Dr. Roman said. Let let that thing. It, it, you learn that the, the, the dollar is not sitting down. We're sitting down here, and uh, we went up to Mike's house and put a furnace in for him, and he gave us some money. And so I come home, and he gives me cash because he knows he gives me cash, and I can put it in my wallet. And I, but Beth got the money, so she got the money he gave me. So I didn't get the money. So she, she starts spending it over the next couple, four or five days and five weeks or whatever, however long it is. And we get down to uh, Pensacola or Jacksonville. She still has a $100 bill. And she looks at me and the offering place comes. She said, should we give something to the offering? And I'm thinking she's talking about her $100. No, she's talking about the money in my wallet. She's not talking about her $100. <laughs> 
So then, so then the next night, they take up another office. Should we get some more? I knew what she was saying, man. You got some more in that wallet? She wasn't talking about her $100 at all, man. She doesn't got her fingers all tied into that thing, man. She ain't letting that thing go until she gets to a place where she wants to get laid. It's looking for, the long look is looking for that city. And that's why you keep hearing me talk about uh, the Pilgrim's Progress, whose builder and maker is God. I tell you what, brother, you can look at those apartments over there and you can say, what is a waste? What are you doing? Wasting all your time on these buildings. Well, you wouldn't be here tonight if we didn't. And one of these days, shortly, hopefully, that's going to be done. And we're going to get back to some business. I got a call yesterday from a uh, guy up, up in the uh, Chicago area. Some, a family moved down here. And he said, hey, brother, we just picking them up on a bus route. Can you, pick, can you see if you can get these, this family in a bus? So I was going to mention that last night. We're going to need somebody who can run a bus, a van. I got a van sitting out there. Uh, it's about six of them that moved down here, off, down off 3rd Street. They're going to need to ride to church. And he asked me, he said, could you go check to see if maybe you can get them in your church? And I said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at that, man. And you know, so the opportunities are going to be there. You know what God does? He says, you're going to take care of what I give you first. I can give you the opportunities. He can pack this place out in a, you don't have to pack a pew, he can pack a church in no time flat. That isn't even the issue. If you're not going to do, if you're not going to set your sights on things in heaven, he said, well, you're, I had people say, well, yeah, it's just a money-making scheme. That has nothing to do with a money-making scheme. It has to do with that's what the Lord gave me to do. And one of these days I'm going to be standing at the judgment seat of Christ, and he's going to say, Mike, did you do with what I gave you to do? Did you take care of this? Did you take care of that? I gave you a wife. First of all, you got saved. Did you seal your salvation in your heart that that's what you were living for the rest of your life? Yes. Okay, now I'll give you a wife. You shouldn't even be looking for a wife or a husband. Until you've got your walk down with Jesus Christ. Because how in the world do you know that that person's going to be walking the same place you're going to be walking 10 years from now? There's no way you can know that. So you just you say, look, I'm going to get my walk down with Jesus Christ the way it's supposed to be. I'm going to have that long look. I'm going to get my eyes on heaven. That's where I'm headed. And I'm going to learn how to walk that walk. And when the Lord wants me to have something else, he'll add it. He never wants you to lose this. You never lose. It's a, you know why he says don't faint? Because by the time you get my age, he's going to dump enough stuff on you, you're going to want to quit. <laughs> and the problems are going to continue to come, and they're, never going, to, they're going to get more and more. So guess what? If you've got 100 things, you're going to have 100 problems. If you've got one thing, you only got one. But if you've got 100, and God starts putting things on, now you've got 100 problems. You need that long look. You look you're looking for that city whose builder and maker is God. That's Hebrews 10, 11, or 11, 10. Uh, everything burning up is 2 Peter 3, 12. I'll give you the verses. The long look is looking for the new heavens and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Man, you know, we get to heaven, you're never going to have a problem ever again. Uh, 2 Peter 3.13, you're not going to have it. The long look is looking for a place where there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Revelation 21.4, 4. neither shall there be any more pain. Former things are passed away. That's a long look. Your, your eyes are out there somewhere. At the same time, brother, you've got to keep your eyes down here. You gotta, you're in the world, but not of the world. You can use it, but not abuse it. Uh, if you keep all this in mind, you can have the victory and get through this thing. Uh, Paul got to go to, you know, Paul had something you and I didn't get. He got the privilege uh, to die and go to heaven. He, he gets something more than we got, man. He gets even better deal than we got. He got stoned, got to go to heaven. Then he got to be resurrected back to life. Then he gets to die again. Then he's going to get resurrected again. And then he gets to go in the rapture. He gets three things. We only get two. Uh, that don't seem fair. And then he gets to see heaven in the, in the middle of that thing. And that's what keeps him going for the rest of his life. You wouldn't let all this stuff around you bother you. If you, if you could see what he did, you wouldn't let none of this stuff bother you. Uh, humans are humans. People are people. Uh, it, the world is what it is. There's nothing you can do about it. Uh, Moses, Moses and the prophets. I like Jesus. He told him over in... Uh, 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 Luke 16, 19, he's talking to the uh, rich man in hell, and he goes, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. The Word of God, if the Word of God isn't strong enough to get somebody's attention, uh, you'll never get their attention. You can't do it. it uh, this thing has to be done something by yourself. It's in, internal. Uh, you're looking for something else. And if you want to be glorified with Jesus Christ, and I was talking about that last night, if you want to be glorified with Jesus Christ, that's coming back at the end of this thing. I'm going, to, I'm going to run ahead of myself here a little bit. That's coming back at the end of the tribulation on those horses with Jesus Christ. The world's going to see you in a glorified state because of what you did. You get, you get the privilege of being there because you got saved. 
But also, he's get the glory that you'll shine, the crowns on your, all that other stuff. Uh, yeah, I was in the Navy, man. You all know I was in the Navy? I was in the Navy. In 1980, uh, I joined the Navy, and I, I went to boot camp, then I went to school, and then I got graduated through school, and then I went to the satellite station. And I started getting these little things called Navy Achievement Medals. And I never thought too much about it. Uh, first thing you get, because all the little sailors, they want these little ribbons. Because when you put your uniform on, you look really stupid if you don't have nothing there. You look just look dumb. So then you start doing stuff, and they give you a, a Navy Achievement Medal. Well, it's a, it's a green and orange medal. It's a little, little ribbon that you put on. And you just put it on. They give you this little bar. You stick it on there. If you only got one, man, that's not really much of any value. So you want a whole bunch. By the time I had like three rows of them, and I had probably three, four, eight, twelve, maybe maybe sixteen ribbons. I had national defense ribbons. I had uh, battle lead ribbons. I had all kinds of ribbons. But I had two right there at the top, man. One was a Navy commendation and Navy achievement. These are actually medals. These are medals. And I had gold, gold, I had gold on one, and I think I had three on the other. I, th I thought I had gold on both, but I think I only had three on the Navy accommodation. But those are, those are medals admirals give you, man. I mean, those are admiral-level medals, and you don't get them just by going to the bubble machine and putting a quarter in and doing this and, and getting them. I mean, those are, those are things way out there. And they make you look good, but they, you can't set your affections on this stuff. I, I mean, they got so mad at me when I got out of the Navy because my career path was set. I mean, it was set. I, I was, it, was, it was in a place where it was like, they thought it was in iron and they could tell me, don't even ask for you're going to the carrier. And I would have done nothing about it, but I'm like, no, the Lord's going in a different direction. You can't, you gotta let this stuff flow through your fingers and at any moment in your life, be ready to let go of something if the Lord says, hey, I'm gonna change directions here. Because if you're, if you're holding on to stuff, he can't. That's why I said about Moses, he burnt that out of Moses. 40 years of the world was burnt out of him on the backside of that desert. And when Moses finally got to the place where everything was burnt out, the little light came on the mountain, and Moses got up here and got a privilege to talk to God. Moses, he said, let them hear them. I mean, let them hear them. I mean, they're not going to listen to this. They're, this stuff right here, I never tried to get any of that. I just did my job. I did what I was told to do. And the Lord was training me how to do what you're supposed to do. You know how I knew what I was supposed to do? I knew what the Navy wanted. It was I had a book, and the book said this is what the Navy wants, and they, they want me to act like a sailor. They want me to fix everything that's broke because I'm an ET, and they send me to all these schools. They want me to have all my rooms painted the way it's supposed to be painted. They want this. They want that. And they want me to be here all the time. They want me to be on time. They want this. That's all I did is what they ask. That's, I just did what they ask. And I stuck my head down while everybody else was having all their party. There's, there's, there's a Christian thing now. This is a Christian thing. While everybody else is out doing their little things, and, and I'll come to church on Sunday, I was actually on a ship working night and day, night and day, night and day. Or I was at the satellite station. Have you ever got run out of a job? I got run out. My boss called me in one day. He run me out of the satellite station. He run me out. He said, Elliot, you need to get a life. You need to get out of here. I'd work 12 hours by shift, and then I'd work another six or seven on other people's hours. And then before this shift, I'd come in six or seven hours on this side. So I would, I would be doing like, you know, I mean, I was like, nye, nye, nye. and he, he ran me out. He took me, he actually, the Commander Balovich, walked me to the front door, put the code in, booted me out the front door, and said, get out of here, man. I said, yes, sir, I'm gone. So I go right around the back, come in the back door, and I go back to work. He didn't even know I was in there. He, he left, and I was still in there working. I had too many accesses to that place, man. I knew exactly how to get back in and out. But you know what I did? I did what I was supposed to do. That's what a sailor was supposed to do. That's what I thought a sailor was supposed to do. Uh, Dr. Peacock told somebody, he goes, Elliot, he, he'll, tell, he'll shoot straight with you. He'll tell you what he thinks. And that's true. I, just, I think a Christian ought to be. Now, am I what I should be? I'm not saying that. I know what a Christian should be. So I'm striving to be that. I got, I'm looking ahead. I, I said, I know, what a, I know what my admiral is going to be wanting. He's going to be wanting something, and I need to figure out what he wants. Are you trying to figure out what he wants? Or are you just going through it? You will have to set your affection on things above. That's second, Colossians 3, 2. If you want heaven to be real to you, this is the only way you're going to do it. This world will not do it. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. It will not do it. This is the only book on the face of this planet that tells you what heaven is. This is the only one that's actually going to get your heart looking at it. If you want heaven to be real for you, you will have to spend time in the book. People say, why do you read your Bible four times, four times a year? So I can spend some time in that book. Do I learn it? No. Man, I, I, I feel like I'm less and less and less every day. 
you will have to set your affections on things above and not on the things of this earth. Although you will have things on the earth, you can't set your affections down here. Colossians uh, 3, 2. When you do that, then troubles you go through won't lay so heavy upon you. You'll get by them. You'll get through them. Uh, people say, well, how do you get through the troubles you're in, in life? Well, you just, I, well, I know the Lord's going to take care of it. I don't have to worry about it. Verse 19. Look at that, man. Y'all didn't think I was going to get to 19. For I reckon, verse 18, for I reckon that the sufferings. You see how much stuff is in one verse? I mean, when you sit there and stop looking, we read this thing like it's just a, a, a novel, and I read it. I read my Bible once a year. Yeah, but did you ever stop to, you should read it. Then you should study it. The studying stuff is for the birds, man. I don't see how, I mean, one verse, I can see how one of those old preachers said I, that, I think it was Luther said that Romans was his Kate, and he would be, the, he'd be in there forever, man. He said, you could preach out uh, Romans your whole life. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, this is Paul talking, are not worthy to be compared uh, with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Verse 19, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now, brother, you've got to get that thing. That is the craziest verse in your Bible. Well, there's some other crazy ones too, but this one's pretty crazy. You're going to get, now you're getting into a doctrine called, uh, it's of salvation, it's called glorification. 18 says, uh, with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Verse 19 says, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Uh, in Romans 8, the doctrine is brought to a definitive statement in verse 29. Go back and look at 29. When you look at 29, it tells you what you're getting ready to... For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So what he did was he pre... When you got saved, he made you just like little Jesuses. Uh, verse 29, uh, whom he did foreknow, he did also predest to be conformed to the image of his son. Uh, go to Philippians 3.21 real quick. Just a couple verses. Philippians. Brother, if you think your life is just humdrum, if you're saved, my, my, my. If you're saved sitting here right now, you outshine Elon Musk easy. 321. There is a, there's a person on this planet, unless it's another saved person that even comes close to it. 321. Who shall change our vile bodies that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto him. Uh, look at one more verse here real quick. Uh, 1 John. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll just read the verse. Uh, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know, 1 John 3, 2, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. The doctrine is that at the rapture, the Lord's going to change you. And you're going to get a glorified body the day you get saved. I mean, the moment he comes to the clouds, and he blows it last trump, and, and we're going to be out of here. And you're going to get a new body, and it's not even going to be the same. And when he says, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth, for the manifestation of the sons of God. Uh, the, the, when you read one, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 15 uh, 1 through uh, 50 or 60, whatever the verses are, uh, that gives you the whole thing about the rapture. Uh, it, what, you're, what he's telling you here is that he's glorifying you, and then it, then it really gets weird. This world is in a bad state. As, it is, as, as has been already stated, the manifestation of the sons of God is the glorification of the Christian. That's what you are. The manifestation is you glorified. You get glorified. The time when he is given a body exactly like the Savior. More specifically, it is the time when those Christians in their glorified body are revealed to the world. I talked about that last night. Isn't it amazing? I talked about that last night in Thessalonians, and here we are in Romans 8, and we're still talking about the same thing. Paul's trying to get something across to us. He said, hey, guys, that thing at the end of this thing, when you come back on those horses, is a big thing. And he said, you're going to be glorified, and how you're glorified there is what you do right now. So I don't know about you, but when I went on those ships out there, when I was at that satellite station, I wasn't necessarily trying to glorify uh, Commander Balovich or any of the captains I had. I was trying to glorify Jesus Christ, my Savior. 
And I was doing the best job. And first of all, I mean, they, they put a, it was like a kid in a candy shop, man. I can't, even, I can't even begin to explain to you what it was like to me. I can understand Elon Musk. I mean, I don't understand this, the two or $300 billion he's got, but I understand the, the motive, the, the desire. You'll get that thing clicking in your head, and all of a sudden this will click, that will click, and the Lord will start clicking things in your mind, and you'll see things that nobody else can even comprehend what you're do- talking about. And you'll start doing stuff, and people are like, what are you doing, man? And you're sitting there, and you do all these things, and everybody says, how in the world did you do that? That's God. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. That had nothing to do with me at all. You know, he, and, and in front of everybody, he was making me look really good. You know what he's going to do to me one day? And you? He's going to make you look really, 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 really good in, like, in front of everybody because of what you did. But it depends on how much you want to suffer with him and, and let him glorify you in this little thing we got like, called life. Uh, if you let him do it, he can do a lot of stuff. Uh, this takes place at the second advent, Revelation 19, Joel 2. The Bible says that the creature is waiting for that, for that revelation. It is earnestly anticipated. I am anticipating it, man. I want it. I, I want to get out of here. People say, well, you're morbid. I don't care. Call me whatever you want to Just call me. Don't call me late for dinner. But I mean, brother, I want to go. I want to go see heaven. I want to see Jesus Christ. I want to see what he's done. I want to be where he's at. I want to always be right. I want to do the right thing. I don't ever want to mess up again. Verse 20. See, look at that, man. We just shot through 19. That ought to make y'all happy. For the creature is happy, now that we're in verse 20. No, for the creature was, was made subject to vanity. That's us. Not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now that creature, uh, that's the old nature. But the whole creation, I mean the whole creation, look at verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together unto now. Back to verse 21. Because the creature itself shall also be delivered from the bondage of corruption unto the glorious liberty of, of God's children. Brethren, we, the, it isn't just us. Nature itself is groaning. Everything is groaning. They're, they're wanting to see us come back with Jesus Christ. Because the moment Jesus Christ touches down on this planet, boom. And he puts everybody under subjection. Part of the curse is lifted. And there's going to be some things that happen in that millennial reign of Jesus Christ that you can rule and reign with him if you want to. If you want to. That's a, there's no guarantee that you will ever get a chance to do that. But if you're not doing something on this side, you, you definitely ain't going to get nothing on that side. Every time the Lord gave a prophecy of his coming, uh, coming deliverer, stating, uh, starting with Genesis 3.15, it was a promise not only to the people, but also to the bushes, trees, mountains, rivers, dogs, cats, lions, tigers and bears, oh my, that means everything. The deliverer would not only save man from sin and hell, he would also deliver the physical world from the curse. When Adam sinned, that curse started on this planet, and it started degrading. Everything started going down the tubes. The only thing that held that up, entropy, in a closed system, entropy will cause everything to just die down. It will eventually die. You take a top and spin it, get it spun up, it will spin. And if you don't add any extra energy into that top, eventually that thing will fall over, weevils, well, weevil wobbles, but it doesn't fall down. Well, it will fall down. Uh, the God is the one who was putting the energy back into that thing to keep it going. Uh, so he's going to come back to this earth, and the earth is under curse, Genesis 3. Your body is under curse, Genesis 3 through 5. I mean, it, you're just under curse. But, but at verse 22, uh, for we know that the whole creation, that's not the old nature, that's not me anymore, that's the whole planet. The whole planet is waiting for Jesus Christ to come back. Brother, this is, this is a serious thing. This isn't a childish thing. This isn't, this whole planet, what you see going on in the, in the world today, it's just not people, but it, it's the, the earthquakes and all the stuff that's happening in this world. Uh, every bit of that stuff is, is the earth is groaning that, that the Lord come back, the, the creator that created him. You ever read in there where the trees will sing and, and, the, and the rocks will cry out and all this other stuff? I mean, you start hearing all that stuff. Uh, he's got this thing where, it, I wonder in the Garden of Eden if, if some of that stuff didn't happen, man. Moses or Adam walks by and here's a big old oak tree with a big smile. You know, see, you, you watch uh, Wizard of Oz and them stinking trees are throwing apples and stuff at you. Uh, they could have been doing that in the Garden of Eden, not throwing them. But, I mean, Moses or Adam's walking by and says, Hi, Mr. Oak Tree, how you doing there? I'm doing good, Adam, how you doing? 
I, it's hard telling what God was doing. It's hard telling. We, we mock everything. We do, those people who got this thing with the Wizard of Oz, they, that thing was more spiritual than, than a lot of people understand. Because here you got them stinking flying monkeys in there, man, that's causing all these problems. And the wicked witch from the West, that's the devil. You get all that stuff, and you sit there and look at the thing, and you sit there and watch it. And I'm not saying Wizard of Oz is a spiritual movie and you should watch it. I'm just saying that they, they get these thoughts in their head, and they don't know where these things come from. That's like Orson G. G. Wells. He comes up with all that stuff, and today we're doing everything that he wrote about way, way back. Where did he get the thoughts for all that stuff? Uh, the earth, the world is groaning. It, it wasn't groaning when Adam was in the garden before they ate that fruit. There was no groaning and moaning or nothing, man. I mean, it was a happy place, happy-go-lucky place. We, we talk about Balaam's ass talking. I have no idea if them animals weren't talking in the Garden of Eden. It doesn't tell you they weren't, and it doesn't tell you they were. But, but, but a cow walks up and says, Adam, yeah, Mr. Cow, what did you just call me? I'm a cow. He called me a cow. I'm a cow. I'm a pig. <laughs> I mean, you don't know what them animals were doing. If, if he can make an animal talk and Balaam and, and the ass talk to him, uh, I did something down at the, the <laughs> I don't know if y'all, did anybody watch that down there, man? I was sitting here. And I was talking about Balaam's ass. I said, and, and, has anybody ever seen an ass talk or, or something? I said, oh, don't, don't, don't answer that. <laughs> I got a good laugh out of it. I don't know what Dr. Peacock did, but I don't really care, man. Said, what do you do, man? But, uh, uh, so the old nation, it's, not, it's the whole planet, man. It, brother, this thing is getting to a place where the whole planet. Isn't it amazing that Paul wrote this back here and he's writing about that stuff? And he's telling them about it. He goes, this world, this world's going to be changed. When? When? Go to Psalm. I'll, I'll read a couple more verses and I'll, I'll, I'll quit. Psalm 24. How in the world could, could he, Paul, but I sit there and listen to that guy and I'm like, I'll never, I could never be, I don't even envy him anymore. I just, I'm thanking God for him is what I do. 24.1. The earth is the Lord's. <laughs> What are you going to do with that, man? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Uh, for he hath founded it upon the, the sea and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend in the, the, the hill of the Lord or who shall stand? So I'm telling you what, brother, you got, got to look at this other one right here. Here's another one. Here's another one. You want another one? I'll give you another one. You look like you need another one. Uh, Matthew 21. It's a crazy, crazy book. Line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. Matthew 21. You notice I haven't told you what verses go to because I don't want you to get there before me. 21, 40, and 41. They say unto him, he will miserably destroy these wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen which shall render him fruit in their season. Jesus said to them, did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is uh, the Lord, man. He's, he is, it's his. Uh, this whole thing is his. And Adam screwed that thing up when he ate that fruit and, and he started a thing called sin into this world. Sin came in by man. Uh, when Jesus Christ shows up, I mean, you ever watch some of them uh, documentaries for Africa and stuff where the lions are chasing zebras and giraffes and eating them up and, I mean, just gutting them and everything else? Uh, Isaiah eleven six, the wolf shall, uh, go to Isaiah eleven six. I still got two minutes, man. Come on. Yeah. Don't be trying to get out of here to eleven six. I remember uh, Fred Lamsdale come up to me one time and he asked me about this. No, Isaiah. Isaiah 11.6. Isaiah 11.6. Verse 5 says, And righteousness shall be, the, uh, shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. Now, you don't see that too much today. 
Uh, the wolf will be the, the wolf, the, the lamb will be in the wolf. <laughs> it won't be like <laughs> dwelling with him. And the leopard shall lie down with the kid. Uh, again, the kid's going to be in the, in the leopard. And the calf and the young lion, the young lion's going to be feeding on the calf. And the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear uh, shall feed. I don't know if y'all watch grizzly bears, man, but grizzly bears just don't really let too much stuff around them. They don't even like other grizzly bears around them. But you get around polar bears the same way. Their young ones shall lie uh, down together. The lion shall eat straw like an ox. And the suckling child shall play with the, on the hole of an asp. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. I mean, when you get into the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, some of the curses are going to be starting to be removed off. And this thing is going to go back to the way it was. And, brother, there are some things that, that are, is possible that they come out of the garden or uh, out of uh, the promised land. And they had uh, uh, some grapes on a staff between them. And these things probably look like stinking bowling balls, man. I mean, I don't know what they, I mean, they just, I couldn't even imagine. I mean, I've been trying to raise grapes for like 100 years. And I, and I finally started to get some, but uh, I had to go out there and do some work. They didn't even have to do the work. They just went in the land. They, the work was already done. And they just got the stuff and brought it back. It's just an amazing thing. Uh, Paul, Paul meant what he said. The creature itself shall be delivered from the bondage, verse 22. The creature is waiting for the glory. Brother, when we come back on those horses with Jesus Christ, this whole world is going to change. And it's because of that right there. You know what our problem is? And I'll stop right here. We don't look at, the, at heaven anymore. We're, we're, we let our eyes get down to here, and then all of a sudden the problems of the world Really, when he says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, there's no possible way you can love your neighbor as yourself if you're, unless you're looking at heaven. Because if the more you look at heaven, the less you look down here, and the less this thing really matters. People are messed up. People are just messed up. They're under the same uh, curse as everybody else. And the only thing that helped me in 1980, I got saved on a back porch in Louisville, Kentucky, and my life changed. And the Lord started changing that thing. And I've watched some people, and they get saved, and they never let the Lord change their lives, and they go right back in the world. And some of them go way, way back in the world, and you can't even tell they were ever saved. They've missed a whole bunch of stuff. I was in that house, uh, that guy's house, uh, uh, and, and I didn't envy one thing he had. I mean, I've seen the house. I know how I, I could have built that house. I could, I could get that piece of property. I could, take, I could probably build that thing a lot cheaper than what he's got in it. And, or not, I don't even know what he got in it, but I could have had a piece of property like that. And I was like, Lord, and sometimes I do that. I said, Lord, did I mess up? Should I have went to that carrier? Because if I'd have went to that carrier, I would have had a job. Then I'd had all this money and I could do all. He says, yeah, but you'd miss all this stuff. You'd have never met Brian. Y'all would have never had any fun over there talking about Mike when he's not there. I mean, and we talk about you guys too. You don't have to worry about it. We get, we get everybody... If, if it comes up in conversation, I mean, you guys are there. We got you, man. But, but, but all the stuff that's happened, I, I made that decision in 1994. That was 30 years ago. That was 30 years of a whole other life that got to be lived out here this way because I made a decision based on God and not me. And the me thing was there. And boy, when I, when I chose not to do that, you talking about a bunch of people getting mad? I mean, here's this kid with all these medals and all this other stuff, and he's like this little glowy thing that runs around, and everybody loves him, and I get to drive around all day long. I mean, I had everything. I had it all. I had the evils. I had everything. And then they give you a carrier. Now, I mean, I, I tell people that, and they look at me like, oh, it's just a ship. For me, that was not just a ship. That was a career move. That was, they were getting ready to make me an officer. That's what they were getting ready to do. That's what that was. I, was. I was becoming part of them, but I had to sell out Jesus Christ to do it. And I said, I ain't going to do it. I just ain't going to do it. I refused to do it. Uh, Paul knew what he said. The creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage. This, the, the animals out there, the lions are tired of eating giraffes. They probably won't care about eating straw, man. They just want to lay there and be fat, dumb, and happy, man. I mean, why do I have to go out? They said a lion, I guess, when they go out and uh, hunt, uh, one out of ten hunts are successful. You don't ever have to worry about that ever again, man. I don't have to worry about it. It's going to be provided. Everything shall be provided. If you go to hell, teeth will be provided. Somebody said one time, he says, well, what happens to those people that get, go to hell with no teeth? Teeth shall be provided. You know, they gnash you the teeth. You will gnash your teeth. But the Lord is going to give us everything. God, God sends rain. God sends sunshine. 
it, it all depends on what we, we think that we have control of stuff and we have zero control, zero. And the more you read this book, I think Paul, Paul thought he had control all the way up to the road to Damascus. He, he studied, he learned, he trained, he did everything. I got to do that in the Navy. He learned and studied and trained. He got to a place out there where all of a sudden he knew something was not right. And then the Lord, I think, he, I think Paul was at the crucifixion. I think Paul, it says Gamaliel was there. So Paul studied under Gamaliel. It wouldn't, wouldn't put me one, one iota to believe that Paul was not there in that crowd watching Jesus Christ die on the cross. And then he sees Stephen, and he watches that thing. And from the time Christ died on the cross to the time Stephen was stoned, there was a lot of stuff that occurred in that time frame. And Paul probably was privy to all that stuff. And, and he went harder and harder and harder and harder trying to get rid of that Christian movement the best he could. And one day on the road to Damascus, the Lord knocked him down and said, Paul, I just read that today. It's kind of hard for thee to kick against the pricks, isn't it? And Paul just broke right there and gave in. He said, I am done. I am done. I am done. I'm going to serve Jesus. He said, Lord, what will that have me to do? I mean, he's already done. I'm done. I'm done. You know, what's it going to take to get you done? That's what, you know what this whole thing is, is what's going to take you, what has a God got to do to you or me to get me done? I mean, he has to do something really, really bad. And, and for me, I'll tell you what it was. It was when they asked me to do something against Jesus Christ, I knew I couldn't do it. And, I, and, I, and it was like the Lord brought the thing right to my, he let me have such a walk with him that I was, I was mean, just a little kid, man, having a blast. And I was by myself going to, and I had some stuff, I wasn't this, you know, Christian out there that's all trying to pass. I, I did what, what I thought you should do, pass out tracks and stuff of that nature. I didn't have a problem with that. I think that if you love somebody, you ought to let people know you love them. Look at this. I'll show you something here, man. Watch this. See that? That's who I love. I think if you love somebody, you ought, you ought to be able to look at them all the time. Beth, Beth actually got in conviction and put my picture on her phone. It wasn't there for a while. I don't know what that's telling me. I know it's telling me something. But I'm sitting there going, you know, if, if you love somebody, uh, then you ought to be trying to get around them. And I, was just, I just found somebody who did something for me in 1980 that I had never met before. And, and I just was trying to do it. And, he just, and the doors just kept opening up all around me, and I could do stuff. And, and I got the, the privilege of doing stuff. It just happened, man. I don't know how it happened. People say, how did you do I don't know how it happened. I, just, I was just like walking around, la, 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 la. And it, the door opened. I'm like, oh, hey, I can do that. Hey, oh, hey I can do that. Hey, I can do this. Hey, they're going to let me do this. And I, can do, and I just did everything. And I did whatever was there in front of me. And I realized that the whole time I was doing that, I was walking through those ships and through those commands with Jesus Christ. And me and he was having fellowship. And one day somebody came up to me and said, hey, you need to get rid of him and come do what I, I said, uh-uh. Uh -uh. And that, that struggle, it was a struggle. It was a struggle. It wasn't that I was, I did want to let this thing go, but I ain't going to hurt him. But I did want to let this go, and I ain't going to hurt him. So it took me a while to figure that thing out. And it took me almost four years to figure that thing out completely. But brother, I'm telling you what, I, I would not go back and change a thing. I want to serve Jesus Christ. Paul knew what it was. Our world right now has earthquakes, volcanoes, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, droughts, famines, mudslides, thunderstorms, lightning strikes, avalanches, blizzards, tidal waves, and a host of other catastrophes and plagues that plagues the earth and will get stronger and stronger until the Lord uh, with his glorified saints. That's us. Amen. That's us. With his glorified, this is my statement. I didn't, I didn't steal this one from Dr. Rubin. I wrote this myself. Plague, uh, all the way from the plague stuff. Catastrophes and plagues, uh, the earth, and will get stronger and stronger until the Lord with his glorified saints appear at the second advent to start the process of eliminating sin and the curse once for all, once, once and for all. Matthew 24, 3, it says, uh, and when he said upon the Mount of Olives, <laughs> uh, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when shall these things be? And, and then he goes off and says, all this stuff is going to happen. But brethren, when he comes back and he, Paul's sitting there saying, guys, you, are, you have an opportunity to be glorified with him one day, and what you do down here right now will determine what that is. I got saved. The day I got saved, I mean, I, I got it all. But it depends on what you do with that. If you want to be an heir with Jesus Christ, I don't know what he would have me do in the tribulation or in the, 
Millennial reign, I have no idea. I hope it's not to fix stuff. Uh, I really am tired of fixing stuff. Uh, maybe you give me a whole bunch of people and they'll fix stuff. And I get to watch them fix stuff. Yeah, there won't be nothing broken. That's true. That's a, that's a true statement. Yeah, smart. But there'll be something to do. You have something to do. If you... But I mean, really, when you think about that thing, it's like, Lord, I, I don't know what, what I would ever deserve anyways. I don't think I deserve anything. But boy, whatever it has to be, it's got to be pretty good. And you know what that is? That is, I, I got to look ahead. I'm looking toward heaven. And I try to keep my mouth, mind on heaven. And I, when I mess up, I get it back off and I put it back on heaven. It's that celestial city, always keeping it there. Father, thank you for your blessings. I do pray that you bless the evening. And thank you for letting us come. Thank you for a book. Thank you for our brother Paul. Lord, thank you for all the things you put him through before he got saved. So that after he got saved, Lord, he could relate to us and, and show us how the, the things all play into being. And Lord, the understanding you gave him, Lord, I, I don't have that kind of understanding. I can read and reread and reread and then get some understanding. But Lord, what that man had was unbelievable and what you gave him was unbelievable and, and the different men down through time. Thank you for Dr. Rubin. Him being dead yet speaketh, Lord, still there. Uh, Lord, what a blessing it is that he can teach us. Uh, Lord, I just thank you for all the stuff you did and all the books, and, but most of all, thank you for our blessed Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and thank you for this Bible. And Father, again, uh, praise, uh, we praise you and honor you, and thank you for making us sons of God. Uh, Lord, help us to go out and win some others, Lord, to you, and, and uh, be busy about our Father's business. Keep our minds and eyes on heaven. And Lord, let this world just go past right on through our fingers. And Father, we'll praise you and honor you in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. Anybody got any questions?